Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. And this week we'll be taking a look at the controversial topic of gender transition in children. And I say controversial because among the general public, there are all sorts of views on this subject notwithstanding the fact that many journalists, academics, and even many politicians sometimes act as if there's only one legitimate viewpoint on the subject, which is the path of unquestioning trans affirmation. And as one of my guests today, psychotherapist Stella O'Malley, acknowledges, gender transition sometimes does prove to be the correct choice for a small minority of individuals afflicted with severe gender dysphoria even though it can mean dangerous surgeries and lifelong drug regimes. But as Stella argues in a new book, When Kids Say They're Trans, A Guide for Parents, co-authored with two fellow psychotherapists, Sasha Ayad and Lisa Marciano, there are serious problems with a policy of reflexive and unquestioning trans affirmation, a policy that became the officially sanctioned approach in many Western jurisdictions in recent years. She argues that parents need to assert their understanding of who their children are, including in situations when they suspect that a child's trans self-conception is a constructed identity that may result from peer pressure, trauma, or internet addiction. And Stella speaks with some authority on the subject, not only as a veteran psychotherapist with a specialty in treating gender dysphoric children, but also as somebody who herself exhibited debilitating gender dysphoria during her own childhood in Ireland during the 1970s and 1980s. It's something she talks to me about in the interview that follows. Also joining us will be a woman who writes under the pseudonym Josie A. Josie, who is the mother of an American trans-identified biological son, is the editor of another newly published book, Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans. Tales from the Home Front in the Fight to Save Our Kids. I spoke to both women over Zoom in September. Here are excerpts from our conversation. Here in Canada, this could not be more timely. I realize you're not in Canada, but I am. Because right now is a debate about school policies in several provinces whereby a child who comes to a teacher or any kind of educator at school and says, I've decided I'm trans, I want you to call me by these new names, the school is not obligated to ask the parents permission or even notify the parents. In fact, many policies, they're actually forbidden from talking to the parents about it if the child doesn't want the parent notified of this transition. This, as you might have predicted, has aroused a lot of pushback, uh, even in liberal Canada. You've had several premiers in Manitoba, New Brunswick, and Ontario who've said this This isn't a policy I agree with and are taking steps to, to roll it back. And the debate about it is really surreal because defenders of this policy of keeping secrets from parents, very creepy, say, well, a child knows their own gender identity and if they're choosing to tell the LGBT coordinator at their school and not tell their parents, it must mean the parents are transphobes. And we even had an op-ed published in the Toronto Star, Canada's biggest newspaper. The headline went... Knowing your child's gender identity is a privilege for parents, not a right, which kind of shows me where the debate is at for people who are hyper militant on the call it gender ideology front. I know that's a loaded term. In this debate, how do you respond to the argument? And this argument gets trotted out all the time. The child knows their identity 100% fail safe. And it's a revealed truth. And if they're revealing it to the educator instead of revealing it to a parent, that must say something about the parent. Because we know what the truth is. Because the child is the official font of unfalsifiable truth when it comes to gender. What do you say to that argument? I think it's very interesting that we've moved from being child-centered to being child-led. And it's happened seamlessly without very much thought. And I actually think our role as adults is to take the responsibility of offering guidance to the child. And this idea that the child knows 
it almost sounds religious to me as if they're kind of they've got some sort of inner wisdom when anybody who has any understanding of age and stage development would be aware if you were to leave child raising up to the children you know they'd eat mcdonald's all the time and they'd they'd never go to sleep they'd be wired they'd be on their devices all the time we don't allow the child to pick their schools we don't allow their child to pick their college courses when they're 12 we we you know we guide them in all sorts of ways around every decision from even from their hobbies and we you know i i'm very 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 pro letting kids be kids let kids kind of do their own thing but not for the bigger decisions the bigger decisions it's more important that parents have input and take their responsibility seriously this very strange new idea that children have some sort of inner knowledge about themselves it's come from nowhere and it sounds nice. It's sound biting. Sounds kind of cultish, actually. <laughs> That's because you're jaded. Well, no, it's because I was a kid once. I believed all kinds of crazy things. This isn't the time or place to go into my, my early childhood psychological issues, but I believe some pretty screwed up things, as a lot of kids do. Especially going through adolescence, it's confusing. It's interesting the expression you used, child-led instead of child-centered. But in, in compiling this book, Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans, you must have had to find parents who kind of escaped that mindset or maybe never had that mindset to begin with. Could you maybe give me an example or two of how that journey might begin for a parent where maybe at first they're confused or they want a affirmation is the, the, the watchword, but how do they get to a more skeptical place where they start to exert their parental authority? Well, I can speak for myself. I, in my gut, knew that this wasn't what was going on when my son revealed that he thought he was trans. And so I had a gut reaction and I never bought it. I didn't believe it. We even went to a doctor that said right in front of my son, you need to support this or he'll kill himself in that. Would you rather have a dead son or a live daughter? And I I didn't buy his argument. If I can push back on that, in the same sense that I absolutely do not necessarily trust the gut reaction of a kid, especially a young child, to say, I'm this, I'm that, I'm trans mask, non-binary, categories that in some cases were made up 15 minutes ago. There are, there are parents of gay kids who say, well, in my gut, I just know this kid is straight, but, you know, maybe he's listened to the wrong kind of music or fallen in with the wrong kind of people. Like, to be fair, adults have incorrect gut reactions all the time, right? Right. But my son had changed his mind on everything. He would be obsessed by trains and then he'd be obsessed by boxcars. And then he was obsessed by Legos and obsessed by Pokemon. In six months time, he changed what career path he wanted to do, what he wanted to study in college. He kept changing his mind and kids change their minds all the time. Those who take a different view on this would, would be horrified to hear you put gender identity in the same category as Lego and trains and stuff, because to them, again, it's this sort of unfalsifiable, like the soul-like state. And, and you do get the sense that the word affirmation actually maybe is apt. It's like you want to say to the kid, okay, you know, whatever you want, if you think this will make you happy. But then what happens is sometimes the parent is making the child a promise they can't keep, which is the world will regard you as a boy or the world will regard you as a girl, but in, in truth, the world won't. In a sense, is it difficult for the parents to come out of that mode because they have made this promise to the kid, at least implicitly, we're, we're going to do this thing together and the world is going to see you as a girl or boy. And, and then when the world doesn't, the parent can become angry. All these op-eds and books written in Canada, parents of some of these kids, this is how they get book contracts, I mean, they're like true believers. And it's hard to see them going back on that. It sounds like from the beginning, Josie, that you were skeptical. Could you tell me about cases in which parents start out as true believers and then become skeptical later on? Yeah, there's lots of cases of that, you know, because a lot of times you're not sure. You've never, you know, you're blindsided. This is something you never thought would happen to your kid because they were, most of us parents, our kids were secure in who they were. And then all of a sudden they weren't. And then you did the research. All the parents who write for Pitt did the research and discovered that there are detransitioners. There isn't really any data confirming that, that kids can do this. So then you, you kind of go down a rabbit hole of 
looking at all the possibilities and you realize this isn't real. Stella will say, we all got PhDs in gender. Um, a lot of parents buy into it at first and then they do the research and then they move on. There's also a parent who wrote True Believers. It's a title in our book where they were socially transitioning their eight-year-old. And then when the younger son decided that he was also trans, that they went, wait a minute, because their older son was a little bit more feminine or something, and they can maybe see it. And then the younger son, who was all boy, when he said, I'm a girl too, it made them question it. And then they did the research, and then they pulled back. It's interesting you say that, because there's a there's a family here in Canada. The woman used to be called Amanda Jete Knox. Now she calls herself something else. And she's she's gone through several gender identities. But I think the husband came out as trans. And then one of the kids came out as trans. And then she came out as trans. But she drew, or he, I, I absolutely, this person has changed gender several times. So I don't even know. She now comes to see it as sort of this group epiphany, kind of like religious converts. She sees it as like a beautiful thing. It sounds, maybe to others, including me, a lot like intra-household social contagion. Stella, you have written, or at least have co-written, in this second book that's been released, When Kids Say They're Trans, A Guide for Parents. There's a line in there that says there's no such thing as a trans child. But surely there are children who are afflicted with gender dysphoria, right? Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, I myself, when I was a kid, had what would now be diagnosed very easily as gender dysphoria for many, many years. And it was a horrible experience. It was it was very isolating and grim. I experienced it for years. In the media portrayals, it's like I am jazz. It's almost like you're lucky or it's something to be celebrated and there's a big party. Maybe just tell us a little bit about the reality of what gender dysphoria is. You know what, you're right to ask me because there's always been a small number of kids who had childhood onset gender dysphoria it generally revealed itself when the kid was around about three or four for me it was when I was three it was almost as you're coming into kind of consciousness you realize you're in this family you're in this home you're who you are mm. a very definitive feeling of wrongness you know the the word alienation it's only when you feel alienated do you actually understand what that word means you know that kind of cold sense of it's all wrong mm. I shouldn't be this I shouldn't be a girl I was so deeply profoundly sure that it was wrong that I should be a boy it was clear I should be a boy I was a better boy than other people I looked like a boy I wanted to be a boy I acted like a boy and everything that I knew said you're a boy you're not with girls I look back and I was quite of a, I was an internal misogynist. I, I didn't like girls and I, it lasted for many, many years. It was a very different time. I was growing up in Dublin in the seventies and the eighties. And, you know, it was kind of a case of benign neglect for me where they just didn't do anything about it. There was a lot going on in my family. So there wasn't any emphasis given to the, the odd third child mm. just doing her own thing, saying she was a boy to everybody who met her, everybody effectively pandered to me and allowed me to look like a boy and act like a boy and hang out with the boys and be with the boys. Nobody really changed. Anybody who did would be fought with by me. So I, I was a very aggressive and assertive kid, which I now realize is kind of classic for childhood onset gender dysphoria. We are a small type. You know, there's a small number. When I say small type, we're a very small numbered type. There's a small number of kids who just feel wrong. And a lot of us grow up to be lesbian or gay or bisexual. It's, you know, the stats say around about 70 percent of kids like me would grow up to be lesbian, gay, bisexual. I'm not sure why we figured why that is. I, I know there's some very interesting theories, but it's 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 interesting and significant. However, the kids in the pit book, the kids in Josie's book, they are not me if you follow me they're not my type of kid I was a very specific type of kid usually through the process of puberty kids like me grow out of it frankly our sexual um, impulses are awakened we start fancying other people we're not so concerned about our inner sense of self mm, that's interesting. We're concerned about our relationship with other people and so we start developing social skills I certainly did realizing I need to be attractive you're starting to look into the outer and that's what most children do during adolescence. Now, the children in the book, 
parents of inconvenience truths about trans. It's a new cohort. They've never been seen in the literature. They have never existed where they were just gender conforming. Gender was not an issue for these kids. They didn't. They weren't like me. That's why it's so extraordinary that this massive rise among all these teenagers are generally not kids like me. Anything between 80, 90 percent of kids like me become comfortable in our own skin eventually. These kids in the pit book, they develop it generally after a trauma, generally after an awful lot of online usage and generally in their teen years. So it's a completely different cohort with a completely different pathway. And yet they're both being told they're trans as if it's some sort of unified experience when it seems to be extremely different depending on what category you fall into. And a lot of these kids come out in friend groups. So, you know, my son and his friend said they were trans at the same time. Then it makes you skeptical. You know, I I know parents who say six, seven of their kids' friends are all saying they're trans. Lisa Littman, formerly of Brown University, who published the first peer-reviewed material on, on what became known as rapid onset gender dysphoria, I think she described it sometimes like a popular figure within those peer clusters would self-declare as trans, and and that could set a sort of domino effect. Uh, Josie, let me ask you a question about what's technically known as comorbidities, underlying conditions. Again, the popular media presentation of this is that you've got kind of just a happy, well-adjusted child not suffering trauma or depression or ennui or anything like that, or OCD or autism, and then says, oh, you know what, I'm transgender. The world throws them a party and they go happily ever after in their new transitioned self. Have you encountered situations like that? Not really. Most of the parents I know kids have gotten worse since the kids declared they were trans. Depressed because he had it in mind that there's something wrong with the world because I look like a boy and I'm really a girl and I'm going to be depressed until I resolve that incongruity? Yeah, basically. A lot of people have gender dysphoria, not a huge number, but certainly a significant number over the years. Some people medically transition, some people don't. Just because you have gender dysphoria doesn't mean you have to transition. It's a decision some people take to alleviate their gender issues. And, you know, some people say it worked very well. And some people say it didn't. And some people who medically transition come to realize that they still have gender dysphoria after they've medically transitioned or if it's even been exacerbated, while others will look at them dumbfounded and say, it's been the best thing I ever did. So I I, I don't think anybody Mm. has the answers here, but I, I always think that caution is the most appropriate pathway when we are so, we're watching such different experiences and everybody is kind of, shouting to be heard and I think it's only right that we listen to everybody there's a very long history of psychotherapists and medics that work in this field that you like listening to the parents is part of it so if if a parent runs into the doctor saying there's something wrong with my child there is respect given to them that's the weird thing about this is that I don't know any other therapeutic context or medical context where the parent's view is actively shunned yeah unless that view is just 100 percent unambiguous cheerleading of whatever comes out of the mouth of the kid on any given day. Is there any other therapeutic context where that exists? No, generally the parent's word is cons- it's definitely noted. Even if the parent seems very, very deeply upset, they note it and they listen to it. Parents are the world expert of their children. There's nobody who really knows or loves their child the way a parent does. And this really comes across in the pit book, that the parents are very loving, very engaged and want what's best for the kid but fundamentally don't believe that medical transition is actually the right solution. They think it's a false hope, it's a false promise, and they genuinely believe that it's going to cause more trouble than it's going to solve. And we're scared to death of the medical harm and the surgery and everything else. We're up at night worrying what's going to happen. We've listened to the detransitioner stories. Josie, not your real name, you're somebody who, as you've alluded to, you, you have a child who's been going through this and you retain hope that you're going to get your child back. As is, as I understand, not uncommon, the child grows up and the dysphoria resolves itself, at least to such extent that they can live a life in the body of their biological sex. The way you talk about that and the way some of the other people talk about in the book of like getting my child back, it sounds a lot like 
people I've interviewed in the past whose whose child enlisted in a cult, where they say, oh, I'm really happy on the ashram, you know, we grow radishes all day, and they embrace all the cult beliefs, they convince themselves they're happy, I guess in some ways maybe they are happy, and then eventually they, they kind of come out of the cult. Have you spoken to people whose children have gone into actual textbook cults, like with robes and drugs and compounds and stuff like that? Like, ha- has there been outreach between parents in those two groups? My situation is my son is estranged. He left a year ago and we haven't heard from him since. We're unable to contact him because he's blocked us. I have gone to estrangement groups of people that aren't necessarily have kids that are trans. But the other thing about my son is he doesn't have gender dysphoria. He sees this as a social justice warrior type situation where he wants to end the gender stereotypes. Wait a sec. So he's he's told you that he doesn't have gender dysphoria and he's doing this as a kind of political affectation? Yes. He knows he's male. He just doesn't want to be that. He doesn't like toxic masculinity and he he doesn't want to be that in life like a, an abusive male i don't like toxic masculinity either but i'm still john if i may ask through indirect means have you been able to keep track of his welfare is, is he doing okay we hear he's doing okay could i just say something about cult experts i certainly follow the work of, of different cult experts steve hassan comes to mind and so does patrick ryan and there's a few others I do think it's very important that the person involved needs to understand about gender, as in the the kind of extraordinary landscape we're in and, you know, the jargon and the acronyms. But an awful lot of parents, you're right in, in bringing that up, an awful lot of parents feel like they've lost their kid to a cult, whether they have or not, they do feel that that it feels there's a wall. And as Josie was explaining, it feels a very political wall as opposed to this is all about gender. It feels a lot more like this is about being part of a a movement and it's very easy to move towards queer theory and everything that queer theory stands for as in dismantling the family kind of subverting the power structures being part of one group as opposed to another and being very derogatory to anything that is perceived to have a power structure such as being white or male or being a parent and so it, it 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 is. It does feel like it's a new phenomenon. It will be in the history books as what happened, just like we didn't know what was going on, let's say, at the beginning of the sexual revolution or the beginning of any other, you know, the communist or whatever. It takes time for us to get an actual understanding of what's just happened. But something big is happening and it's anti-parent. And it's anti-family. I mean, I live in California and they just passed uh, AB 957, which takes the parent out of control of their own child. There's all these school boards that passed an initiative to that they can't keep secrets from parents here in California. About five or six have passed it. And the attorney general is now suing the first school board that passed this even in ultra liberal Canada, they've done surveys and something like 70 or 80 percent of survey respondents, and that's all survey respondents. If you just took mums and dads, I think it'd be even higher. They, they want to be kept informed. Like this is not a popular issue for progressives. In fact, one of my fears is that, uh, and you already see it happen in, in very conservative states, is that the backlash against this stuff sometimes is genuinely transphobic, where, where they deny any kind of transgender therapies, even to children who are persistent in their presentation of these symptoms and maybe could benefit from it. Well, we don't believe that. I mean, if you're a parent and you saw your kid overnight do what my son has done, none of us believe that any kid would benefit from giving them puberty blockers or hormones. We don't believe that. And I'm in favor of these bills because doctors will give kids like mine, who's not gender dysphoric, hormones and puberty blockers because they want them. And so if you can't get doctors and you can't get people in charge to help parents, I'm in favor of these bills because somebody has to stop children from harming themselves. There is this other category who maybe exhibits symptoms more in line with something like borderline personality disorder, seeking to control situations, create conflict, maybe attract negative attention. We have this transgender activist and street organizer in Ottawa, calls himself Faye Johnstone now. They named him Grand Marshal of the Ottawa Pride Parade, 
and he showed up in a shirt with a, a knife on it, threatening turfs, pejorative word for, for women who believe in biology. It was, it was a completely bizarre outfit, but it struck me that this is a person who ostensibly wants to make the world a more welcoming place for trans people, but by this person's behavior and rhetoric, and has, has also just all sorts of misogynistic outbursts online, is flamboyantly off-putting in the way he presents to the world. How common is that kind of behavior? We spoke earlier on about the childhood onset gender, or who usually are same-sex attracted and usually grow out of it when puberty comes. And then there's the kind of the pit book type who are the teenagers. And we don't know much about them. They're only about 10 years in existence, roughly, you know. And we're finding more and more huge numbers of those teenagers have autism. They're often quite meek. They're often quite um, nerdy and socially awkward. But there's a whole other type that we haven't spoke about, which have always been there in small numbers, but they've always been there, which is middle aged men who are often erotically fixated on the idea of themselves being women. Autogonophiles. Yeah. And so that's a third section and they can be very, very loud. And so, you, you know, when we talk about trans and when we talk about gender dysphoria, we have to be aware, well, which of those, which group are we talking about? Because they're very different types of people. And on top of that, there seems to be a, a group that are incredibly disturbed. They seem to be fetishized. They seem to have be pornified. They seem to be a new group, but they're very loud. Maybe they're all autogynophiles or maybe they're just very, very disturbed individuals who will always latch on to a movement. Every movement we've ever had in, in human history, they latch on. The up. weird part is that, again, in Ottawa at least, they've, they've taken it over. It's very common towards the end of movements for the extremities to take over. And it feels like this is kind of happening. I don't think this is the core of most people who are trans identified. I think it's the extremities and it signifies we've gone into kind of late stage. Pardon the interruption to this week's Quillette podcast, but I just wanted to bring you this short reminder that Quillette isn't just something you listen to. It's also something you read by heading over to Quillette.com. This week, you can read great new essays on Saul Bellow, Samuel de Champlain, and Alaric, King of the Goths. Plus, essays by Bernard Lane and yours truly about the rise of gender-focused ideological radicalism in Australia and Canada, respectively, and much, much more. That's all at Quillette.com. And now back to the Quillette podcast. Some of these people, because of their personality types, just will not stop until they take over these activist subcultures. But often they're completely unrepresentative. Like, so I play a lot of board games. The board gaming community it has a lot of autism spectrum cases. It has a lot of people with, with some gender issues. And I know plenty of trans people. They just want to they show up. They want to play board games. They're not looking to invade female spaces or walk around with t-shirts that have knives on them and stuff like that. Some of them identify as transsexual, which is sort of a, a term that's sometimes used by maybe older school trans-identified people who want to make it clear that they, they still believe in biology. One, one trend you do see, I guess it manifested in some of the stories in this book when kids say they're trans. Anecdotally, I've seen it in my life where you have somebody who, you could tell they were battling things, they're like depression or whatnot, but they had lots of interests they had lots of hobbies. And one of the most dispiriting things about this gender thing is that sometimes they, they announce to the world, I'm non-binary or I'm trans, and then that's it. They actually lose track of their other hobbies. They stop being funny. There's something very totalizing about this. Some of these kids, they're just in their room surfing trans stuff. For instance, my son was an athlete. He gave everything up and all he did was fixate on trans. He stopped seeing friends. He got really sucked into anime. What is it with anime and trans? There's all these middle-aged men. They're convinced they're women and their avatars on social media. They're just obsessed with Japanese cartoons. I don't really know. I just feel like it's because it's all kind of androgynous. Right. And they get sucked into it. We thought it was innocent. He would have us watch these anime movies and they seemed pretty innocent. You know, they were family-oriented movies and... We didn't understand the connection. We never have figured it out. But I know that that sucked him in. But he gave up everything. He gave up Boy Scouts. He gave up sports. He wouldn't leave his room. But this was also during the lockdown. He was just home. Stella, what's with the anime? 
It's fascinating. I'd love to get the time to study it a little bit more. There is the aspect of the androgyny. There's also something that isn't maybe mentioned enough around anime. It's escapism. And some argue that trans identification for some people is escapism. It's escaping from the reality of, of your life. And, and from mortality. Yeah. Anime characters are all in this sort of timelessly youthful, creaseless bloom of youth. The specter of our own deaths haunts us all, uh, some more than others. But if you can reinvent yourself to a different sex, maybe you can fight father time, right? I think that some people who are identifying as trans bought into a dream world almost, an escape. It isn't as much, just like Josie described her own child, it's not as much about having this feeling, a sense of alienation from your own body and more about, I want to be something arguably you know a fictional character I, I, want, I want to be this kind of puff the magic dragon yeah it's very interesting and it feels very very reflective of this digital age autogynophilic men in the way they dress it's often very strange because they either dress like their great grandparents wearing like victorian smocks or they dress in this highly like sexualized sort of nymph like clothes that no actual woman would wear. Well, I've certainly noticed it. I'm sure Josie has too, that there's there's one is the highly sexualized version of a woman and the other is the kind of your grandmother version of a woman. Neither of them feel very much like a real portrait of what it is to be a woman. And both versions feel um, almost 2D, if you follow me. They're, they're very... They exist outside time. It's escape. It's escape from reality. I'm going to be something different. I'm not going to convince everybody I'm something different and I'm going to present as something different. I'm going to enough medication so that I do. Which you can do online when you're playing these role-playing games. Often the first half hour of immersing yourself in these three-dimensional role-playing games is outfitting your character down to the minutest detail, like eyebrows and eyelashes and skin color and, and yes, your, your sexual equipment. Josie, did your son get into video games? Yeah, he loved video games. You know, where you could have an avatar and you could change skins and he was all into that. But I also want to say that I feel like some of those men that you were talking about, these are men that didn't get a lot of attention from women and maybe they wanted that. And acting out, they get a lot of attention from women. I know that my friend's sons who are trans identified, they have a cheerleader who's pushing them. They never had any attention until they decided they were a woman and all of a sudden the whole world is praising them they're getting girlfriends because they can be within a girls group so it it kind of keeps them there because they were ignored before in this culture war debate over the gender issue you sometimes see conservatives or people who are pushing back against the gender stuff they'll use terms like groomers they'll say like okay groomer they suggest that the whole thing is about sex i think there's many reasons not to use that kind of language but among them is the fact that from what i can tell a lot of these people seem to be fleeing sexuality. The last thing some of these trans-identified teenagers want is to have sex. In many cases, they seem terrified by sex, or at least terrified by their body changes. We change in all kinds of often really unsettling ways when we go through adolescence. You can see why someone would be attracted to puberty blockers, regardless of whether they had gender dysphoria. Could you tell me a little bit, Josie, did you see a kind of aversion to sexuality in some of these stories that are contained in this book? Well, we always wonder about how much porn has played into it. And a repulsion to porn. Correct. I think when we were growing up, sex was a mystery and you were excited by it, where I think these kids see too much and then they're repulsed by it and they don't want it and they're afraid of it. Is this primarily biological females who are repulsed by the porn or is it does it go both ways? It goes both ways because I think some of the boys see horrific porn and they think, I don't want to do that. They also grew up through the whole Me Too movement. They're afraid of hurting a woman and things like that. Although ironically, the movement itself has misogynistic overtones, but maybe that's an irony they don't realize when they're in that moment. You could argue, it's not necessarily true, but it, it seems to fit in lots of ways, that the, the girls are, are running away from being a woman and the boys are running towards being a woman, but it's all centered around woman, if you follow me. That's so interesting. Both of you said interesting things during the podcast, but I'm putting a gold star next to that one. And you see this in the debate, right? When the United Nations Commissioner on Women or whatever, and it's like, what is a woman in this 17-paragraph okay. thing about a woman is somebody who is in the state of being womanified, just some gobbledygook. But 
What is a man? Oh, a man is a dude. No one cares what a man is. Helen Joyce, who's been on the podcast before, is, I said it to music, actually. I had her read out definitions of what a woman is from various activist groups and stuff, because it sounds like the most horrifying Hallmark card you've ever received on Mother's Day. We know what being a woman is, too. <laughs> it's just people are questioning it. I know you two know it. <laughs> you know, we have noticed, you know, in, in parent groups and stuff, that there's been a, a very heavy proportion of, of mothers and again, I bring it back to God. It's it's so about the female. Mm. The, the the blame on the mothers. I've seen it as a psychotherapist. How the kids are vitriolic about the mother who is trying to, for example, affirm and use pronouns and names, and they're quite blasé about the dad. Oh, the dad. Oh, he's just funny like that. They're very casual about the dad, who's probably not even as affirming as the mother. But it, it, it's really noticeable to me. And I haven't figured it out. It's just this centering. It feels like when you brought up the Me Too movement and stuff, it feels like this extraordinary phenomenon around being a woman is what's going on here. And, you know, it could be, of course, repressed sexuality. I do think it is for some. And some of it, it, it it's a kind of a, a distressed sexual kind of urge. But the woman issue, whether it's mother or being a woman, is really, really, really big in this in this particular world. Josie, I don't presume to know about your particular circumstances, but in your experience, how does the male-female father-mother dynamic play into this? Because I've heard anecdotally that sometimes the fathers get away with being more blasé. It's like, oh, dads are so goofy and they never get it. And sometimes, especially when it's a daughter, there's more of kind of barbed relationship between the mother and the daughter. Yeah, I, I do have a husband and, you know, it's hard for the dads with a son because, you know, they were very close and to deny that that's what they are anymore. It's kind of tough on dads because they had a dad son relationship and all of a sudden that's sort of taken away from them. My husband will never give up on my son and he was always there for him. And he listened to everything he said. He didn't affirm it, but he didn't make him feel bad about it. I sort of overreacted, but my husband was always very calm. So I'm the one that did all the research. I'm the one that did everything. And my mental health suffered, but my husband stayed true as a rock. Stella, you've written that when a kid comes out as trans, whatever your suspicions are as a parent, you should resist the the impulse maybe to push back in a hard vociferous way could you explain why that's the case myself and and sasha ayad and lisa marchana we try not to be prescriptive because we think the disempowerment of parents has been a massive issue in this and so if a, a parent is listening i'd be very reluctant to say they shouldn't do this or they shouldn't do that however i think i think there's great value in saying your piece i i really do however most parents when they're these days, in this new context, when their kid comes out as trans, generally the kid is six months ahead of the parent. They have been online and they have digested massive amount of material. And we all know it's filled with jargon, it's filled with concepts. So the parent will easily make mistakes and they will be taken down and used as evidence against them. So if at all possible, it's probably better for the parent to listen and figure out what's going on for this kid. What's this driven by? You know, is it escape? Is it that they hate their body? Is it that they've been online too much? Have they become captivated by this idea? Rather than going in with all your information, it can be more valuable to figure out through kind of gentle questions that give the kid time to speak. It isn't easy, but it's probably more valuable. Josie, were you tempted to take the 147 articles and studies that you found online and print them out and dump them on your son's desk and say, here, educate yourself, read this? I did a little bit of that. I think what Stella is saying is true for parents. I feel like I didn't do that. I suffered with my own mental health rather than being more empathetic to what he was going through. But I was just so blindsided. If I had maybe known about this or had the information, which is why we wrote the book and why we're trying to talk to parents is so that they have a little bit of information going in. So if their son or daughter says they're trans, they might have a little bit 
of information. So they don't do what I did, which was ultimately he went to the school and they affirmed him and celebrated him. He had a teacher that kind of groomed him towards doing this, which we found out later, you know, even tried to get him housing out of our house. Really? Yeah. So maybe had I been more sympathetic and more in a different way, rather than being the authoritarian parent, like, nope, we're not doing this. And I think I maybe pushed him out the door, not that I meant to, but I, I was so afraid he would hurt himself. I was so scared. So Stella's advice is really very good. If there's people listening to this, and I guess there probably will be because this episode probably will be suggested to people who are in this situation. If you're a parent whose child has just told you that they believe they're transgender or one of the different varieties of non-binary or whatnot, what's the first thing they should do? What's the first resource they should look at? There's lots of resources out there. Myself and Sasha have a nice podcast. It's called Gender Wider Lens and Really, our book came out of that, and it's it's all about different aspects of, of gender. This is Sasha Ayad? Yeah, and I think there's a nice episode in there where Sasha, I think it's episode 14, she gives the kind of voice of the teenager, and then I give the voice of the parents. So th- there is things like that, and Genspect is an organization that I'm very involved in, and we, we try to just provide a kind of rational approach to, to sex and gender, a healthy approach to sex and gender. There are tons of resources out there. Both of these books, when kids say they're trans and then Parents of Inconvenience, Truth About Trans, both of them will give different views on this story because one of them is the therapist's view and the other is the parent's view. If you've read both, you'd get a perspective on what could be going down. There's lots of books with the first person narrative of what it's like to be trans and people don't really get it because it's very hard to describe somebody else's experiences But if you can be compassionate and gentle and admit that you don't know much and ask your kid for patience and say something along the lines of, I don't know much about this. I'm going to read an awful lot. I'm going to commit myself to learning an awful lot about it. I'm not comfortable with you being the authority when I'm supposed to be guiding you. So you're going to have to give me some patience here and I will catch up and I will learn. But it's going to be as fast as I can, but it might not be as fast as you want it so that I can give you good guidance because you know you're the most precious thing in the world to me and I want to make sure that I'm a good guide as your parent. And I would say that I think the best thing to do is get parent help. There's parentsofrogdkids.com that parents could go to and join a group with other parents. I think it's really helpful to know that you're not crazy. You're not alone. And I didn't know what to think. And once I went to that site and I saw videos from Stella and Sasha and Lisa Marciano, and it gives you everything you need to know as a parent starting off. And then there's also the GDSN that Stella runs, you know, where you can talk to other parents, because I think the best way when you first encounter this is to talk to other parents and these groups find you other parents. And And before maybe even reading, I think that's the first step. Josie is the pseudonym for the mother of a transgender identified child. She is one of two editors on the book Parents with Inconvenient Truths About Trans, Tales from the Home Front in the Fight to Save Our Kids. Stella O'Malley is one of several co-authors on another recently published book, When Kids Say They're Trans, A Guide for Parents. I'd like to thank both of you for appearing on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 